So I'm Jeff, I work at Facebook. I work on our uh, JavaScript infrastructure team, which is just a weird way of saying that I work on JavaScript tools at Facebook. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about Jest, which is a tool that we've had internally for uh, actually kind of a couple years now. We use it for testing, um, and I thought it was really, it's really useful, and I open sourced it about two weeks ago, um, mostly for selfish reasons, because I wanted to use it in my personal projects. But you guys can play with it too, because it's pretty cool, I think. So um, to start with, like, before we get into like, what my, the, one of the most interesting features of Jest is, I wanna go start from the beginning and talk about like, how do like, we design apps as just like human beings, right? We see this app in our head, and it's this vision, and we have this idea of like, visualizing this app from the user's perspective, um, but that's different from how you build the app. The way you build the app is you actually break it down conceptually into smaller pieces. Um, and these little pieces help us like reason about the app as we go. We can progressively iterate and like have a partial prototype that we can play with and iterate on and so forth and so on. Um, and the way that these pieces usually manifest themselves, at least historically, has been scripts, but recently we have modules as well. So we have these scripts. Um, this is this hammer that we've been given um, for however long JavaScript's been around. And they're basically bags of statements, and you put them in you know, your HTML page. And if you put a second script, you have two scripts running together. And one of the problems with the scripts is that they run in this global scope, so they have this, this disappointing nature of like potentially interfering with each other. So really quickly to uh, illustrate an, a, a simple example, let's say our app, we wanna be able to log in um, and we wanna be able to quickly uh, personalize the app and show the user's name in the app. Say, hello, Jeff, or whatever. So we write a script. It has this get user uh, object function. And it just talks to the Facebook API and like gets uh, the, the first name and the last name from the Facebook API. Um, this is cool. So we build this, we test it, we integrate it with our UI. We go play around in the browser while before we check this whole thing in. Um, we try it, right? This is before we send their diff out for review or check it in. And we make sure that when we actually, this thing actually works. Like if you click login, it actually gets some information from Facebook and says, hello, Jeff. Um, so that's great, it's good. We go on, we build our app. Two months later, we decide, well, not everybody has Facebook. Some people wanna use Twitter. Some people don't like to use Facebook. Um, that's okay, so we just wanna get people's names so we can personalize our app and pull their name in. So we go and we build another library script file, very similar, almost identical. Um, except this time it's calling off to the Twitter API and getting the, the username and the, uh, the first name and the last name that way. So we test this the same way we tested the Facebook uh, script. We go in, we play with it, we log in with Twitter, we see that it says, hello Jeff, we're good. We check it in, we push it, and all of a sudden all of our users start reporting they can't log in with Facebook. Well, damn it. What happened was we overwrote, oh, too far. Do that again. <laughs> we overwrote that get user object function. We were so focused building our Twitter API library script that we forgot that we already had a function named that. And scripts clobber each other, but we weren't thinking about that when we wrote it. We weren't even thinking about it when we were testing it because we were so focused on testing the Twitter thing, manually testing, that is, um, that we just put it in there and tested the Twitter and it worked, so we thought we were good to go. So this is where modules come in, and I don't think I'm telling anybody anything new here. Everybody, I think, or most people get the, the why modules are a good thing. They offer these two sort of forms of isolation. They give you the ability to not clobber other things in your app, which is awesome, by, by default. So if I write a get user object in either of these modules, it's not gonna clobber each other. But also, with all of the various module systems that we have in our options today, which is annoying, but that's another problem, um, they all offer the ability to explicitly specify how we interact with the rest of our app. So ES6 modules, AMD Common JS, you can require or import, um, and you can export from all of these. And the nice thing about that is you explicitly identify the things you wanna, in, you wanna pull in from the outside, and you explicitly identify the things that you want the outside to be able to pull in from you. That's really important in being able to reason about a small chunk of your app at a small piece of time. But, um, that's how you design your app. Let's talk about testing. So if you write some automated tests, let's say we wrote some tests here, um, it's really useful to have your tests give you some information about when your, when your uh, application might 
fail before you push it off into production. So one of the first things that's beneficial about tests is that they pass and fail. They give you this immediate indication that something is wrong with your code before, and, and it's maybe something that you didn't even think of. It's the Facebook library broke or whatever. Um, but this kind of test message sucks. It's not very specific. It just says the API library failed. So really what we want out of tests, we want that signal of failure, but we also want more information. We want to know what failed. Let's, let's like narrow that scope down to figure out exactly like if, if all we had was that failure, the, the API uh, module failed, we have to go manually figure out how the test observed that something failed. But if we can write tests that actually give us this information, Twitter API .get user object never called its callback, that significantly reduces the amount of time we have to spend trying to figure out what went wrong. And the test did it for us. So the next question is like, well, I'll just recap here. Basically, you have this sort of debug problem. You, wanna, you, you find out that a problem or a bug exists, tests give you this very quickly and very easily because they pass or fail. The next question, or the next thing that you want to do is you want to be able to reproduce or figure out how, that, how to observe that bug. If a user sends you a bug report, if they just tell you that your app is broken, you don't, that's not useful. It's the same thing with tests. So you need to know how the tests observe that something failed. And then once you have that, you can dive in and find the root cause. This is kind of similar to uh, what Chris Shido's talk was the other day. It was like isolating the area, the problem domain, and being able to narrow it down to the smallest search, search space. Um, so we have this app, and we need to figure out how, we've broken it down into pieces to build it, but now we need to figure out how to break it down to pieces that we want to test. Well, one of the most traditional ways uh, that you do this is you just observe that you have these modules, and there are these grooves between them, right? Each of these orange things is a module. They might talk to each other. They have little sort of links between each other. Um, these, but because you have these nice little separations between these modules, it's very easy to be able to cut them apart. The only thing you have to cut in those little grooves in between the modules is the links, is those requires and those imports. So this is where Jest becomes very useful. But one of the benefits of being able to cut out a piece of your app is that whenever your test fails, if you know that your test is only test is only exercising code within that white square, let's say that one module, you know that you've reduced your search space in your app for the problem to that white square. So now debugging that test becomes much easier. So where I'm going with this becomes much more apparent when I actually start showing you code. So here's a very simple um, test that we'll start writing using Jest. Uh, Jest ships with Jasmine um, right now, at least. Uh, we are hoping to be able to make it so that you can plug in different test frameworks as well. But we'll start with Jasmine. Um, and if you're not familiar with Jasmine, basically the way you, your standard test boilerplate goes is you write a describe, and that's your test suite in traditional terms. And you have your it, which is your spec or your test. And describes or test suites can have sets of test specs and tests in them. Here we only have one. And you see that we require Facebook API right here. So what we're doing is we're getting access to this module inside of our test. And this is the module we want to test. But this is the thing we're doing right now. I got ahead of myself. In real life, what would happen if we did this, like in real life, like say Node or Browserify or whatever, uh, what you're going to get back is an object that looks like this. It has this get user object, right? And it's a function, and it does this stuff that we saw earlier. But in Jest, what you actually get, which is interesting, and my favorite part, is you don't get that. You get a mock function. You don't get the real thing. This is actually problematic because you want to test the real thing. Right? Here, we're, we want to test the Facebook API. But Jest mocks everything by default. So we have to tell Jest not to mock the Facebook API. But it's cool because we've told Jest exactly what we don't want mocked, and everything else, Jest will just do it for us. It's not that magical. Uh, the way it works is whenever you require a function, Jest goes off into like an isolated environment, actually requires the, the, the module. And the reason the, the environment is uh, isolated is to make sure that any side effects that happen when you require that module don't affect your test environment. But often secret, it goes off and requires the real module, looks at the exports object that, come out of it, that came out of it, says, oh, there's a, well, a get user object function. And then it builds a fake version of what it saw. And that's what it gives you. 
So when you do things like requiring other things, let's go look at that Facebook API module that we're requiring in the test. At the top of this module, we're requiring XHR. Well, in our test environment, when we execute Facebook API, because we've said don't mock it, Facebook API doesn't get the real XHR module by default and, and automatically. It gets one that looks like the Facebook API module. And you can see that the, uh, or sorry, the XHR module. You can see the XHR module has a get function that it exported. Well, just has generated an auto, just has automatically generated a get uh, export for you. So if you actually were to call that function there, it wouldn't do anything. It's just mocked. And the whole point here is that you don't want to exercise any code that isn't in that white area. Because if your test fails, you want to be able to be guaranteed that it's something that, it, that you need to search within the white area, not within your entire app. So I've added some contrived stuff here to make the testing example simpler to uh, explain. But we've, uh, I've basically added a user cache here, um, and I've primed it with information about me. Um, and if you call user object now, rather than always going out to the API and fetching the information, it will go to the user cache first. And if it's there, it'll return it. If not, it goes off and gets it. Um, so uh, let's see. Yeah, let's get to the back to the test. So coming back to the test, uh, we've required our Facebook API module. All of its dependencies have been automatically mocked. So whenever we do anything with it, we're only going to be executing code within it. The next thing we do is we want to go ahead, because this test is making sure that our callback function is called. We want to make this mock callback function. Um, and we're using Jest uh, has a utility for generating uh, mock functions. It's, uh, it's almost the same thing if you've heard of jasmine.createspy. It's the same thing, except we just didn't want to couple Jest directly to Jasmine, so we included um, non-coupled mocking utilities. Um, creates this mock function. All the mock function does is records the calls that are made to it and the arguments that are passed to those calls. So now we're going to call our real version of Facebook API.getUserObject with Jeffmo, which remember I primed, so it's in our cache. And then the next thing we do here is this jest.runAllTimers. Uh, this is a really cool feature. It's, it's really, it's just like, I didn't come up with this, but somebody, whoever came up with this, is, it's, it's really neat. Basically. All we want to do in this test at this point is wait for that set timeout zero to go. Because remember, it was like uh, cached, which we contrived for this example. So that set timeout zero isn't going to happen until the next event loop. We don't, we don't want to wait. We're just running a test. We just want to fast forward through time. Jest gives you the ability, because you're in the Jest environment, you can run through all of the pending timers and exhaust that timer queue right now imperatively in your test. So you don't have to wait. There's no like asynchronous test. There's no like if your test callback never runs, then you have to wait five seconds for your test to find time out. That, none of that nonsense. You just run your timers now. Um, and then lastly, you can do your expect. You expect that mock callback to have been called with your stuff, and this should pass. Uh, let's see. So that's how you, that's the high level, like the most interesting feature of Just, in my opinion. Um, otherwise, most of the other features are just things that you've probably seen before. So, but the biggest uh, benefit to the fact that these things exist in Jest, in my mind at least, is they come together. So uh, you can npm install gjest CLI. You just simply CD into your project and you run the Jest command and it searches for your tests, finds them, executes them. It executes them in the Jest environment. This is very similar to like the, Mo the Mocha CLI uh, or the Jasmine node CLI that you might have seen before and probably lots of others. Um, so uh, let's see, yeah, you, you, run the, you run the test runner, it searches for your tests, it finds them. It also executes your tests in clean environments each time. So every time you run a test file, at the end of that test file, it's going to clean everything up. Any side effects that may have happened, any modules you may have required, any module state, it all gets cleaned up. And then when you run the next file, it, it's starting from a clean state, it's late. So no test can interfere by means of side effects with the next, next test. See how I'm doing on time. Oh, I got plenty. Um, what, this, what this actually gives us, though, is the ability to run tests in parallel. So we do, by default. The just command line runner not only finds tests and executes them, but it actually, by default, boots up a worker pool of child processes. This is a node 
pro uh, program right here, uh, just as a node, node program. Uh, and it shells out to those uh, child processes and runs your tests in, in parallel. And this is extremely important to us at Facebook because we have thousands of these tests and we have to run them like often and fast. So we run our however many thousand, I probably should look that up, um, tests uh, in well around a minute, a little over a minute, which is pretty cool. Um, let's see, the, the, the other interesting aspect of Jest is uh, something you might have also seen before is that it ships with JS DOM. So JS DOM, if you haven't heard of it, is a way in Node of sort of creating a, a fake version of the DOM APIs, and they work. So if you do document.createElement in, in your test, it actually returns an object that looks like a DOM element. So you can actually write tests on modules that are actually interacting with the DOM, creating things, putting things in the document.body, so forth and so on. And then in your test, you just query selector all for it, find it, assert that it did what it was supposed to do, and you can do your test that way. Uh, that as well is, is, is cleaned up in each version, so you get a clean version of the DOM in each, each run of the test. And I should clarify, because I get this question sometimes, um, when I say we run tests in parallel, we run test files in parallel. We, it's, it's a very hard problem, and I'm not sure if it's even possible to split those specs up into parallel, but um, if you have like this huge test file that takes a really long time, it's, uh, it's, it's the, the quickest optimization you can do is split that test into two so that you can run both of them in parallel. So just to clarify there. Um, I think I sped through that way faster than I expected. So that's the gist of it. Uh, you can check out um, Jest by installing it, npm install g. Uh, you can check out the code and the documentation. And we also, most of us hang out in uh, Freenode, uh, pound just js. Um, and I'm not always on my computer, but I will at least try to answer questions and such. Uh, yeah, LBL Jeff. I think I'm done.